ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋಧಸ ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ನಮೋಧಸ ಭಗವತ ಅರ್ಹತ ಸಂಬುಧಸ ಬುಧಂ ಧಮ್ಮ ಸಂಘಂ ನಮಸ ಎಸ್ಸಿಡೈ ಈ ವಾಸ್ ರಿಮೈಂಡೆಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸಮ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೈ ಥೈಮ್ಸ್ ಇನ್ ಥೈಲ್ಯಾಂಡ್ ಟೆನ್ ಇಯರ್ಸ್ ಆಲ್ ಸೋ ಅಗೋ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಮೈ ಲೈಫ್ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ಟು ದ ಸಂಘ ದ as a as a layman anagarika novice in the, the first few months as a bhikkhu i left uh, thailand after i'd been a monk for about six months i was there about two years altogether and uh like many people my first contact with uh meditation with uh, buddhist practice uh initially there was uh uh some wonderful illuminating experiences quite uh quite marvelous uh, amazing uh, insights and uh and mental states that uh that appeared in the, just in the first few days even and uh so from being a a wandering beach bum um looking vaguely for ultimate reality <laughs> somewhere after the next tea shop um i found myself uh utterly uh enamored of buddhist monastic life and uh you know, the some of the the experiences i had during those this first uh, few days particularly were in, uh, of a nature that i'd never experienced in my life before they were tremendously powerful spiritual mystical experiences and uh and the result of, of this was that uh, i found myself uh utterly delighted with um monastic life and very uh, thrilled and and eager to pitch myself into it as any 21 at this time just uh, left university about 6 months before plenty of vigor and uh that first year it seemed that as a, a great deal of um uh problems and worries and uh worldly uh, worldly feelings uh, fell away completely sexual desire just kind of vanished like a a light being switched off i thought that was easy <laughs> and uh my past life my uh, my life before coming to to thailand just it vanished like a like a vague dream i remember after i'd been there about 6 months thinking a year ago i was doing my final exams no 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 can't but yes one year ago i was doing my finals i was sitting in an examination hall doing papers on psychology and physiology and it was like the most bizarre unreal an uh, idea but i knew it was true but my past had uh, just fallen away completely it's like a vague empty dream and so that first year was very idyllic uh, very very pleasant um uh, but then towards the end of it things the the uh the more uh, worldly uh earthy passions started to uh, bubble up again it was like for many people um first contact with meditation one doesn't really have any preconceived ideas about it and the mind is uh the desire mind hasn't 
latched on to meditation as something to, to get any uh, get much mileage out of, but after a while it does, and so that um, meditation become can become quite um, a goal-oriented activity. But at first, the mind is quite naive and open, and and uh, so many people, their first meditation is is uh, quite a wonderful experience that they never quite managed to repeat again. Ajahn Sumedho often talks about this. When he was teaching English in Bangkok, he went along to a, a monastery to learn meditation. First meditation sitting uh, he attended, and sat down, closed his eyes. The monk said, OK, now concentrate on your breath. And just instantly his mind went into this blissful, brilliant, ecstatically peaceful state and just stayed like that without, without a flicker for an hour. So he thought, oh, this is great. <laughs> this is great. What have I been missing out on? So then three or four days later, he went back to class number two. Lesson number two was sit down, close eyes, mental drivel, <laughs> pain in legs, etc. for an hour. So uh, it took him a few years to get back to that, that uh, beautiful place. But anyway, after a year or so in the monastic life, by, I was an, uh, a novice by this time, then I started to get a lot of um, obsessions and cravings, and, and like most people, I was discussing this with Ajahn Kisaro the other day, we both went through the same kind of experience, that the sugar, the, uh, the sugar cupboard in, the, in Thailand, um, and as a, a monastic, you, because of eating one meal a day and having no other outlets and a, a vitamin-free diet, <laughs> um, one develops the most enormous interest in anything sweet that will give the body a hit of energy. And um, in order to keep the... the the sweet things uh, safe from ants and termites, what they do is they make a little cupboard and it stands on a single stilt surrounded by a moat. It's like a kind of symbolic. <laughs> I think it's supposed to create suggestions in the minds of the residents as well as keep the ants off. But anyway, this it's called the sugar cootie, which means the sugar hut. It's actually only about, uh, usually about a couple of, about two or th three cubic feet. But um, in one's mind's eye, it becomes the largest building in the monastery. It kind of dominates one's perceptions. And at this time, um, just because of various circumstances, I was the only uh, anagarika or novice in the monastery. So I was the drink maker. That was my domain. And so I had the key and the control over the sugar cupboard which meant that the monks had to endure my creations. Also, my creative streaks were, were frustrated in all other avenues, so I had to, to wreak all of my, um, my artistic potential came out through the spout of the, uh, the tea kettle. So there were some pretty alarming <laughs> incidents that I won't go into. But anyway, I developed an enormous... Um, Sweet, uh, a sugar craving and a sweet tooth that was so strong that I would taste this drink and think, it's pretty bland. Mm, they won't like it. And I, and, uh, uh, and I kind of put a few extra spoonfuls in and then serve it up and then you'd see these monks who all had sweet tooths as well. We'd just sort of gag. <laughs> <laughs> and be absolutely unable to drink this stuff. And, and there'd be me sitting there thinking, hmm, not quite enough. <laughs> there was one that I made that was, uh, that uh, nobody else could drink except me. I drank about eight glasses of it. <laughs> it, was a, it was a rose cordial. I remember distinctly it was pink. And the villagers, the local people, also have an incredibly sweet tooth. And they too became unable to drink some of my creations. So after a few months of this, I began to mistrust my own taste buds. They had to hire tasters. 
I would get a, a passing monk or, or one of the others to, uh, to taste the drink because I just didn't trust my own taste buds anymore. And so this was, um, I could see these kind of obsessions and, and uh, mania, uh, maniacal aspects of the mind kind of coming more and more to the fore and these uh, blissful, um, ebullient uh, states of mind were becoming slightly obscured, completely obscured. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, I remember I was always thinking a lot, uh, and quite busy, but um, by the time I got into my second year, and then uh, um, I became a monk then, yeah, as a monk then, I was uh, the, um, your position as a, as a, you know, as a drink maker or having access to the kitchen or anything like that, it's all cut off. You're completely dependent on what, what you're given. And in Thailand, it's uh, uh, very, uh, very strict standards of, of um, of uh, ownership of possessions and things, so that you know, nobody had any uh, any tea or coffee or sugar or, or anything. You had to just depend completely on what on what you were given. And I've been staying at the international monastery for a long time, ever since I arrived. And so they thought, time this fella got out of here, and, and they sent me to Wat Bapong, the main monastery, which is a very austere place. So there I was, a new monk. Uh, just a couple of weeks into the ro- uh, into the robes as a bhikkhu, uh, in uh, the big monastery with, with very few other Westerners, and and uh, all alone. Well, I mean, lots of other monks, but you know, very much left to um, to uh, get on with the, with the practice. And so, um, as these uh, first couple of weeks went by, then this sort of the intensity of the the uh, the searching mind, looking for something to get a purchase on, and something familiar or, or comforting to uh, to seize upon, was was getting more and more desperate. And then a letter arrived, a letter from England, from my mother. And this letter said, um, a, the usual sort of greetings and uh, news and so forth. And then she mentioned that uh, my grandmother, who was getting towards 90, uh, was, her health was failing and it would be re- and she would very much like me to see, very much like to see me again before she died. So it was, this was like, uh, you know, a, a treble hit of, of coffee cocoa. You know, it was like a real thing for my mind to get a hold of. And, uh, and get carried away with, and it was, uh, it was. Uh, I guess I was just so lonely, and uh, there was so much mental energy, just so much uh, momentum of the mind used to having things to to get uh, its teeth into, and suddenly this was uh, um, just seized upon, and there wasn't even you know a tenth of a second to get any mindfulness in there. It was just like. <laughs> The thing was out of the door and away before it was uh, there was uh, you know, any ability to, to really reflect on it and to, to think you know why is this suddenly so important you know my grandmother would been like that for years you know <laughs> and I'll probably get to go back to England sooner or later but anyway anyway my mind took off with tremendous vigor and uh, I and this at this time Ajahn Chah was away he was this was his second visit to England and. Uh, when he came to England and America. So he was away and I deliberated about what I was going to do and what I was going to do and what I was going to do. And so I asked the senior monk at Wat Papong, could I go over to Wat Nanachar, the international monastery, and ask the senior monk there um, about this? So he kind of grumbled and, and uh, poked fun at me and, and said, okay, as is the way that things are done. So I went over and spoke to the senior monk and he sort of, grumble, 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 you're only just been ordained, you know, you should stay here five years, grumble, grumble, she's only your grandmother, grumble, grumble. <laughs> and so, this poor little thing in me, which was absolutely sure my poor granny really wanted to see me desperately, and you know, I really ought to to do this, because by this time, England and uh, peanut butter sandwiches, and 
such like uh, things are becoming terribly uh, interesting. And also Chidhurst was, was looming. You get these interesting tapes from England with uh, wonderful talks from this amazing Ajahn Sumedho character who I'd never met. I'd become a, a monk uh, um, uh, after he'd gone to England. I, I arrived in the monastery, so I'd never met him. I only met his reputation. So there were Ajahn Sumedhos in England and, and my mother and, the, and uh, the peanut butter and... Uh, yeah, everything. My granny, my grandmother, I kind of had to keep bringing her in. To <laughs> to kind of, yes, granny, you're right, you're right. Remember granny, yes, yes. She's the point of the whole thing. And so I was, my mind was coming up with all these marvellous uh, and, and impressively sincere reasons as why I really ought to go to, to England after the, after the Vasa, of course, of course. And the monks at uh, the International Monastery were not in the slightest bit convinced. They knew this was just uh, a new monk with a, a restless mind, desperate to have something to play with. But, uh, so I was in a position of struggle, so then I spent the next two months at Wat Bapong, pacing up and down and sitting, thinking, 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 thinking. And uh, eventually, um, Ajahn Chah came back from uh, abroad, and so I, I took my, um, my life in my hands and went and, and asked, if this would be possible to do, and I hired one of the monks uh, who could speak Thai to come along with me to translate, and I kind of very cautiously put my question and asked if this would be all right, and he said, sure, <laughs> no problem. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, well that's that then. But then I was, uh, this was my first Vasa as a bhikkhu, so then I was uh, invited to go off and spend the, the um, the retreat, I thought, well, this is very straightforward. I just do a nice little, you know, three months retreat off in one of the branch monasteries and then go off to England afterwards, see my folks, uh, go and say hello to my granny, go and stay at Chidhurst. Marvellous, great, very nice little scenario. But then there was this feeling in my mind, what are you doing? You don't need to go anywhere. I mean, what's all this garbage about having to go to see your granny? I mean, come on. You know where this is coming from. Then I shut up. <laughs> and so, uh, that, uh, even though it seemed quite straightforward, and I had the approval of Ajahn Chah, you know, the master has said yay, um, still there was this, this agonizing doubt going on in my mind, because I knew I'd just manipulated the whole situation. There was something in me that, was, that, that saw that very clearly. And anyway, I thought, well, it'll be a nice fast. So this senior monk, he's invited me, uh, this abbot of this branch monastery has invited me. You know, special invite, pretty good. And I was going to be the second monk. This is amazing. All the others were very newly ordained monks as well. Oh, this would be great. Bit of a uh, star treatment. Very nice. Off in some little branch monastery. But unfortunately, there was this other character. Uh, this large Thai monk. You remember Doi? That one with the big stereo? This was a monk, and he was a very, very, uh, very, it's very sweet in some respects. But he came and stayed at the International Monastery for a while, and he was into everything being big and best. And, uh, and he, used, he used to sneer at your tape recorder because it was so small, and he had a big one. <laughs> you remember? <laughs> Yours is probably about three times more expensive because it was, but it was smaller. So he thought, well, this is the one I've got is much better. And he had a big arms bowl, and he was physically very big. He was very, he was quite young, very handsome. Obviously, been spoiled rotten, and uh, was uh, inc had an incredible arrogant streak. And uh, so he managed to. Uh, to irritate just about everybody at what Nana chant. Do you remember him? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, so he was at Wat Bapong Pong at the same time as me, and he asked me where I was going for the Vasa, and I kind of played dumb, because I could see what was happening. And, uh, but it, uh, the wheels of karma were turning. And uh, he decided that he should come and spend the Vasa where I was, which uh, I almost begged him. <laughs> to, but for the, for the benefit of his practice, he should go. 
<laughs> meditate someplace else, but he didn't. And he came along. So this beautiful idyllic little uh, uh, place in the in the Royette province, this was about a hundred miles north of, of Wat Bapong, was uh, embellished with the presence of this this venerable brother. And uh, so the, during the Vasa, there was this constant um, kind of. Uh, Criticism and fun poking and and uh, so on, uh, kind of irritating presence of this monk who was always kind of getting at me or teasing me or making kind of insulting remarks about my ancestry and <laughs> or lack of ancestry, and uh, and there was this uh, kind of whole welter of uh, painful things going on in my mind, and then also being the only Westerner in this monastery. And being the kind of place where a leaf falls off the tree, it's the event of the day. You know, you can sit watching a spider's web, waiting for some action for three hours. You know, it's pretty quiet kind of a place. And then they were doing a lot of building work, and I thought, oh great, they're building, they're going to they're build this new sala, marvelous. I'll get stuck into that. And then, and then uh, the Ajahn said to me, would you like to help with the building? And I said, yes. This is someone like Susan going for the <laughs> her bike ride. Like, yes! And he said, okay. He gave me a nail and a hammer. He says, knock this into this piece of wood. Well, oh, this is a test. <laughs> okay, be really mindful. Get your mindfulness. Now is your moment. You've got to get this right. And dop, 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 dop. I thought, pretty good, pretty good. Didn't bend the nail. And he says, uh, maybe you could sweep leaves. <laughs> <laughs> so I was on leaf sweeping. Because my, obviously my nailing was not... Uh, not up to uh, up to scratch. So that was it. I was off the building crew and just sweeping leaves, and and that's there stuck in my hut with my mind. So there was this uh, whole kind of enormous uh, you know, swelling in my mind of, of doubt and and uh, feelings of embarrassment and self-criticism about manipulating and. Going to England after the Vasa and and trying to justify that and and then trying to to uh, to deal with you know the irritation with this other monk and the fact that you know he was he was another bhikkhu and not the devil incarnate, which is <laughs> very easy to portray. You know the monk sitting next to you just uh, can become responsible for you know half of the evil on the planet. <laughs> Just by your power of projection, just, uh, you can you can get pretty narrow-minded. So anyway, there was this uh, enormous amount of, uh, of kind of stuff swirling around, and um, and the, the reason why this came to mind this was the the background to the poem I I uh, recalled last night it was I was sitting in my hut one day, and. Uh, and I was sitting there, I had my eyes open, and um, uh, a leaf fell off a tree and came spinning through the air and landed on my lap. And I don't know if other people have the same custom, but, but uh, when I was a child, then I was always told, if you can catch a falling leaf, then you get a wish, you can make a wish. And so instantly my mind went, oh, a wish. And then... I thought, well, what should I wish for? And my mind went totally silent. And, and I realized at that moment that even though there was all this uh, powerful and, and uh, difficult uh, fears and desires and self-criticisms and, and irritations and uh, the whole array of, of different uh, things billowing up in my mind, bubbling up in my mind, that something in me knew that that everything was all right. That behind all of that, prior to all of that, there was this tremendous silence. And after the thoughts, I thought thoughts were gone. There was silence. And there was this tremendous 
direct understanding and seeing into the all rightness of everything. And so that one could see that, yes, there is all of this struggle and confusion and, and self-criticism and, uh, and so on. But something in my heart couldn't say, I want it to be otherwise, with a kind of clear, uh, conscious choice. I couldn't say what I, uh, I wanted. There was, I knew in my heart, there was nothing, no thing. No place I could go, nothing I could have, nothing I could uh, fill my mind with, nothing I could do. Nothing that was necessary to make the moment perfect. There was actually nothing missing and nothing extra, nothing really intruding. And that was a tremendously liberating moment for me. It was, uh, it was like the first real insight uh, into the, um, the way that, that even though our senses and our heart can be filled with, with all sorts of, uh, of difficult and conflicting feelings, powerful emotions, great passions of, uh, of attraction and, and, uh, and love or, or fear, anxiety, restlessness, that there is a great silence that surrounds that, that is behind that, that supports that. So every, every something is a celebration of the nothing which supports it. that even the, the uh, uncomfortable and painful experiences of life come out of the silence, go back into the silence. Which then makes the, the passions and the, the, uh, the problems of life, it gives them an overriding sense of all rightness, which doesn't mean one is... Uh, and of passing everything off and just being passive and, and just uh, uh, excusing heedlessness or, or defilement or not saying there's not you know, effort to be made to, to not recreate or not to compound uh, our problems or our, our um, inabilities or our um, insufficiencies. You know, we make effort to improve that which is wholesome and, and to develop that, to bring, give rise to the wholesome. And we make effort to, uh, to check and to renounce the unwholesome. We make effort in that way. But the whole thing of that is seen within the context of fundamentally behind everything. It's all all right. Everything is okay. This is all functioning according to Dhamma. This is all Dhamma. As a, a little appendix to that, uh, the story, um, as the end of the, the retreat came closer, even though I had had this insight, still the, the thoughts about going back to England and the, the feelings of... Uh, self-criticism and, and remorse about uh, manipulating uh, and the doubts that were there were getting, getting pretty strong and um, I felt very uncomfortable about the whole thing and, and a bit ashamed and, uh, and then um, what I'd arranged was after the, the retreat season had ended two weeks after it had ended I was due to go down to Bangkok to start fixing up my ticket and arranging going back to England. And then a week before I was due to go, uh, a telegram arrived from England. And the telegram said, Dad, very ill. Can you come? My, heart, my father just had a heart attack. He survived and, and he was okay. But I held this piece of paper and I, I don't believe it. 
I don't believe it. All along, that uh, and it's, it's scheming and maneuvering and justification of three months' worth of solid doubt. I mean, how much sticky rice had powered the <laughs> three months' worth of, of doubting and, uh, and self-criticism. And uh, all along, I was... Uh, it was going to turn out that uh, I was going to go back anyway. Because, of course, you know, if there be sickness in your family like that, then you just you go without a second thought. So I felt uh, somebody had been teasing me, but I, I learned a lesson. I mean, after that, I, I swore on whatever there is possible to swear on that I would never, ever manipulate a situation ever again to get what I want. But... Um, that uh, that insight, I think, is something that's extremely important now in this uh, time of uh, the, the brewing up of war and being so much on people's minds and being people being pounded by the media to to be thinking about uh, about it all and having our minds directed in that way repeatedly it's very crucial to be able to uh, see through the uh, the feelings the emotions the uh, the streams of thought that arise around um, something of such intense uh, power such intense impact on our minds to be able to uh, experience the transparency of thought, the transparency of feeling, and to bear with, to fully hold the, the pain in our, in our heart, the, the struggle or the, the feelings of despair that, that arise. Because, uh, you know, a lot of, of uh, our life, and this is not just because of the time of war, but uh, just in the, the general course of our life anyway, and particularly engaged in the spiritual path, where you're, you're turning away from distraction, just killing time with entertainment of one sort or another, but where one is, is say, developing the spiritual path, then a tremendous amount of effort does go into learning to uh, endure the, the arid and uh, dull plateaus of life, the, the desert experience. You know, the other day we were talking about, uh, about this. And in, uh, in Hermann Hesse's book, The Journey to the East, his hero gets uh, sidetracked in the um, Morbio Inferiore, the Valley of Despair. And uh, he gets separated from the rest of the party and gives up, and uh, gives up the journey, uh, only to to uh, to uh, pick it up later on. But that experience of being in the valley of despair uh, forces him back, makes him turn back. And um, and what you experience uh, in, certainly in monastic life, and I'm sure that, that uh, the same, because they're never really having practiced as a lay person, I don't really have that much experience myself, but from having talked with people a lot over the years, one certainly gets the feeling that uh, lay people experience despair and disappointment, uh, frustration and so forth uh, in, a, in quite a great measures as well. You know, our efforts seem to be unrewarded. Like, you know, I couldn't work out what I was doing wrong. You know, how there I was in my first year, just first few months, just so, uh, mind so kind of peaceful and, and uh, bright, happy, cheerful. And, uh, and, there, and then after some time, and then when, uh, after that, that uh, rains retreat in Thailand, and then when I came to England, the first few years here in England, just a lot of really dull, black, dreary mental states, just kind of pulling yourself through uh, passions and obsessions and uh, jealousies and, 
and uh, really tiring, wearying, disappointing. Think, well, what am I? What am I doing wrong? I mean, it was all so good at the beginning. Maybe I'm just. I've got. I've got. A, made a mistake somewhere along the line, and it's all going wrong. But what one, what one recognizes is that uh, one can have a clear insight, a clear vision of truth, a momentary vision of truth, of the the purity and and peacefulness of the natural mind, of the the true nature of mind. But then we still have the karma of our birth, of our lifetime's habits. You know, a lifetime, or many lifetimes, of of, uh, attachment to the body, to emotions, to feelings, to all the events that have occurred, all of the, those things which have uh, pleased us and, and pampered us, all those things which have hurt us and wounded us, all of the, the uh, achievements and failures that have occurred. Every single one has had, a, uh, has had an effect in the mind and we feel the ripples, the echoes of, of our actions and the actions of those around us, weak or strong, uh, powerful, uh, beautiful and enticing or, or painful and... and uh, and uh, horrible, you know, according to, to what has happened. But we, uh, the experience of the desert, the desert experience, is meeting all of uh, the, uh, the results of our past karma, like paying our bills off. And this is, you can see in every religious tradition, they have a, uh, they talk about this, there's different symbols for this, of this uh, going through This kind of unrewarding phase where you're, you're, you're working, you're doing all the right things, but uh, you're not getting the result that you want. You're not getting the goodies. In, the, in Judaism, like the 40 years in the desert, that is uh, very much symbolic uh, of this, the uh, freeing the, the Jewish people, freeing themselves from, the, from slavery, and then escaping, and then spending 40 years in the desert before reaching the promised land. Well, the desert they were stuck in, it would only take you about six months to get across at the most. It's not, I mean, 40 years is an awful long time to spend there. But it's, (laughs) they must have had very bad navigation. (laughs) But uh, in uh, in esoteric uh, Judaic tradition, what this is pointing to is the, uh, the endurance of the desert experience of just once you've, the, you've broken the initial bondage, you, you've broken free from slavery, you've uh, entered upon the spiritual journey, and an Israelite actually just means a spiritual seeker, one who seeks truth, one who seeks God. Once you've broken the bonds of slavery, you then have the desert to go through. And 40 years is like far, far longer than you want to be in the desert. (laughs) It's like the length of time where you are able to completely give up hope of ever getting out of the desert. And you you surrender entirely to the feeling of, well, the desert feels like this. (laughs) This is life in the desert. This is what it's like. And so when we open our hearts completely to the, uh, uh, the vipaka karma, the resultant karma of our lifetime, like the, the humbling um, reoccurrence of, of old attachments and fears and, and problems we thought we put behind us years ago, they bubble up and recur. It's uh, uh, the way out of the desert to reach the end of the desert is when we open our hearts completely to um, to the fact that this is how it feels. This is the way it is, and I I uh, do not want it to be any other way. If I'm waiting for the desert, to, if I'm waiting to get to the end of the desert, then my life is is full of suffering. Waiting is suffering. Waiting is suffering. When we talk about patience, what we mean is the readiness to live for eternity 
with how things happen to be. Not waiting for it to be over. Then, when our heart is open in that way, then we experience a, a wonderful flowering. In, uh, in the Sufi literature, there's a, a beautiful story called the, uh, the Parliament of the Birds, and it's a tale of, of these, uh, this party of birds who go off to, uh, to journey across this great desert to meet, uh, to meet with God, who lives in a castle on the other side, of course. And uh, it's it, it's a, the the story is a play on words because the word for God that they use is simorg, and simorg is also a word which can translate as thirty birds. So it's actually uh, out of thousands of birds who start out on the journey, only thirty of them make it. And during the the um, the uh, the course of this journey, eventually, uh, just a few of them get to the castle, and they they. Uh, they, um, they never actually get to meet with the Almighty. But what they get instead is um, uh, a few verses, one of which is, this is God speaking. I drink my servant's blood, and he is hurled in frenzied turbulence around the world. And when he is destroyed and cannot find his head, his feet, his passions, or his mind, I clothe him in the splendor that he is one, and grace enfolds him, radiant as the sun. So when we give up, when we're completely destroyed, that means when all self-concern, all um, uh, all holding back, all complaint about about life is renounced, relinquished when we open our hearts completely to how things are, then we find the experience of grace. We find the radiance and purity, the peacefulness that is, is always available to us. This is how our, the karma of our lives is brought to fulfillment, to completion. We end the, uh, the karma that has uh, been created. We bring it to its... its uh, its fullness to its its final fruition. We take it to its ending, and when uh, when something ends, when something is brought to completeness, then what is left is peacefulness, purity, radiance. The use of meditation then, meditation practice, in a sense is to be able to develop that kind of strength, that kind of fortitude, that readiness not to to wobble, not to give up, but to learn to be uh, enduring, steadfast, to be ready to keep going when your mind wants to... uh, to, to come up with any kind of reason at all for you to give up and go uh, do something else, go someplace else, just, just uh, some alternative. The, the strength of heart that is able to, to just bear with things, be open to how things are, and with that full acknowledgement that uh, clear seeing, then we find ourselves in the, uh, in the position of right view. We can see clearly. It's like the promised land is just right view, right seeing. That's what, uh, the, uh, what we arrive at, that's the end of the desert, is clear seeing, because then uh, when we we see clearly, then we can respond to the different aspects of our life 
the beautiful and the good and the, uh, and the fruitful as well as the, the difficult and the painful, when there's clear seeing, then what arises in our actions and our speech is, uh, is wise, is kind, is uh, caring and compassionate. That's the natural, the natural order of things. We don't have to think about that or will it. It just flows forth in that way. It's a natural response. So that to, um, to make this journey, make the journey across the desert of, uh, of life, The original recording ended abruptly at this point. Mm. Mm.